Good afternoon, welcome to this double act on citizen science and earth observation. Let me start with a little bit of context. Um, we're presenting to you here in the context of CISL, and you go, CISL, what's that? Perhaps a lesson learned for your hackathon, pick an acronym that people actually know how to pronounce. We were given this acronym by our funder, but we figured out we could pronounce it as CISL. So here we go. CISL actually stands for Citizen Science Earth Observation Lab. That's an initiative funded by the European Space Agency, which we run from IG Delft, where I work. And the overarching uh, motto of CISL is how can we catalyze these two rather separate fields of citizen science and Earth observation to address societal challenges? Um, in a way, we're sort of small odyssey in that we run this incubator to go from lots of ideas to fundable pilots and projects. And we've run this incubator already once, and we have five pilot projects running at this time that uh, address different societal challenges and bring together the power of citizen science and Earth observation. And we're here at Odyssey and this and our challenge have lots of challenges and perhaps the most obvious ones that have a link with earth observation and citizen science you might think are the conscious cities and nature 2.0 but i think this is really also a space for us to explore where do you see potential links and use of citizen science data but also involvement of, of citizens more broadly um, but also earth observation data so that's why our theme is well the stuff happening up there in space but citizen science lots of it down here on the ground how can we draw on the potential of these two developments? The session is very simple. I will start off with some do's and don'ts in citizen science. Then I'll hand over to uh, Lucas, who will take you through Earth observation data sets and how you can access them and use them, how they can be uh, applied in real life, particularly to the challenges. And then we will have time for the Q&A. Let me put things in context also in terms of where am I working. I work at IHE Delft. It's a research institute. So I feel a little bit lonely at this event. I don't think there are that many academics around with lots of developers. Overall, we're here to strengthen the capacity of the water sector, particularly in the global south. And I lead a team on citizen science where we do action research on citizen science and a number of projects that I lead or lead the main contribution for IHE. And we um, really explore what is the potential under what conditions can we get the best out of citizen science. We currently have citizen science projects running in Europe and Africa and in the Middle East. So we really get a good spread also culturally, geographically. So let's move on with the do's and don'ts in citizen science. Citizen science comes in many guises, many terms that seem to have partly overlapping meaning, um, volunteer geographic information, very much focusing on the uh, geospatial aspect, public participatory GIS on the participation elements, and so you go on, citizen observatories, crowdsourcing. At the essence, they really mean we're evolving people in new ways to collect data, as we see later on, perhaps also more. And this can be done in the comfort of your home or in the mapathons that we run both at IHE in Delft, but also in Africa and different locations, sometimes even simultaneously. We um, bring students together and usually pizza and beer serves very well to incentivize them to show up and then uh, help us analyze the data. But of course, citizen science, a lot of it, what people also typically associate with the term is data collection in the field on a whole range of variables. So I'd like to share with you three do's and don'ts in, in citizen science, um, as perhaps you like to embark on the use of citizen science in your different hackathon teams. So the first one is to say, don't underestimate what citizen science is and what it can mean for you. So traditional science, you might remember, there's the scientific method of how we produce knowledge. We start with a question, we design our study, we have a data collection effort, we analyze the data, understand the results, and depending on whether we're scientists, then we publish the, data, we publish the paper. If, if uh, um, we are manager, then we take managerial action. So a lot of it also is related to um, the evidence that's used in environmental management. When we bring citizen science into the game, of course, it involves the public now in the scientific process. And the biggest assumption 
from many people who are less familiar with citizen science is that this data collection stage is the one and only and most important stage in which we inf can involve the public when we talk about citizen science. But citizen science has many shades of grey, perhaps not 50, but certainly five we can see here that have been distinguished. And they're distinguished in terms of the extent to which the invo we involve members of the public, i.e. untrained uh, people that ha have not had the scientific training to undertake the scientific process in these different steps of the scientific method. And so we see very clearly that some of them really focus only on the data collection and others go full stream and really involve uh, the public in every stage and tap into not only as citizens as data slaves, but tap into the experience and knowledge, agenda setting, raising questions, etc. Citizen science comes also in terms of all shapes and sizes, sizes, not only as far as the stages are concerned, and they're repeated at the bottom, but also the educational levels, which members of the public can we actually engage? So we see various ranges of educational levels, but in principle also we can engage all ages. So in some, the, the entire public um, could, be, could be involved. Moving on to the, the next uh, item is, let's make sure that we don't see citizen science as something that's plug and play. That's very easy to do. Now, talking to a predominantly technical audience, this may be a, a, a sensitive point to make, but of course, citizen science is not only about technology. It's not a matter of, let's develop some apps um, so people can help us collect data. Let's visualize the data and put it online. Um, we process the data. We can use SciStart or other platforms to put the right tools together. And then we have citizen science going. And once we have to find our project, we can put it on Zooniverse and people will just come. Well, perhaps they won't. Just because we open, let's say, we democratize science in some form through citizen science doesn't mean everybody of that full public that are just sketched in principle could uh, participate will actually have the time and the interest uh, to participate. And moreover, particularly when we're talking about citizen science to address societal challenges, it's not good enough to think about a bilateral relationship between the scientists and, and uh, the citizens, but certainly decision makers, policy makers, industry, various other stakeholder groups also come into play that help us uh, address these societal challenges and perhaps even define them in the first place. So what we're dealing with, no less, is actually a collage of different incentive systems. And I will not bore you with the science that we've done on the incentive systems alone. Let me just say they are very different. What scientists are interested in when they embark on citizen science, what policymakers expect in terms of, oh, this is how you do public participation, and the kind of changes that citizens actually, you know, very concretely in the short term hope for, these are real clashes and we have to find ways of finding compatibility in these issues so that we don't have disappointments. Which leads to point number three to say, let's not pre-cook citizen science in the, in the scientific ivory tower, but let's think more about the co-design of citizen science to address these societal challenges. And that seems to be right in the mainstream of this event, which is all about co-creating solutions. And perhaps this is the, the overlooked actor, if you like, uh, in, in addressing those societal challenges. Some argue that citizen science is the only way to attain all the SDGs. And again, that alludes to the fact it's not just about collecting data, it's about awareness raising, it's about identifying issues bottom up, it's about people's behavior change on a large scale. But at the same time, let's also be really realistic, and this goes back to the incentive systems, people have time constraints. Ourselves, you know, in the Western world have, are very busy with work and life balance. Other people in poorer regions of the world are busy just putting bread on the table. So engaging them as citizen scientists is quite a different challenge. And how far we can stretch our ambitions with citizen science really has to be seen in this context. But there are ways of actually doing this, the co-design. For example, we developed a co-design methodology of how you can co-design citizen science for sustainability. And sustainability in the dual sense of 
um, setting up citizen science activities that last over time and give us greater um, temporal resolution, of course, and foster these relationships uh, between different actors that are really important to make a success, but also sustainability in the more classical sense of sustainable behavior, taking care of our environment jointly. We um, uh, had no less than six countries and seven citizen observatories that we've set up. So you see the geographical spread through Europe and Africa. And on the right, you see the different identities that they have come up. Not only have they got different names and different logos, but let's say in the ground truth, how style, they focus on fundamentally different challenges. So it was not from a project perspective that we Im imposed thou shall monitor water quality or air quality. Actually, we started with a blank page with these communities to identify what are the local challenges that they are dealing with in Mechelen air quality, in Sweden water quality, in Africa it's natural resource management and the very complex human wildlife conflict. So we, you see we're talking here issues that are not that easy to crack so really um, qualify as societal challenges and if we give the power in terms of the methodology to actually drill down to what those issues are, engage the right stakeholders, we can go a long way with then engaging them in the data collection, but also the analysis, the visualization, but perhaps most importantly, the action that follows once we've collected all this evidence and once we've created these new relationships. So just to indicate that the wide range of different types of communities we've engaged with in all kinds of climates, all kinds of uh, socioeconomic conditions, and as I said, we worked with them on issues that are important to them, um, rather than imposing this from ourselves. To summarize, um, citizen science certainly has the potential to address societal challenges, but it really requires a very careful approach to doing this. And I hope it's really clear, it's also more than just data collection, it comes in all shapes and sizes, and of course, by means of our approach, we give it a certain shape or size. So it's people that matter. Technology does too, but it's people that matter perhaps first and foremost. Who's involved? Why are they interested to be involved and to continue to be involved? Um, and how can we best tailor to their capacity and their interests and their availability? Uh, and for that, it's really important to clarify and also agree. What is the purpose? Why are we doing citizen science in a particular setting? And what are we trying to achieve with this? Um, is it in a large data set for a scientific publication? Are we really aiming here for societal changes, new social practices, policy change, informing agendas? These are very, very high level ambitions and take a lot longer to materialize. So technology is important, but for each case, we actually need to know what we need. So we need to start with the social dimensions of citizen science and then look at what are the enabling technologies for our particular purpose. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lucas Martinez from Starlab. Starlab is a company uh, in Barcelona. 20 years ago, it was found, uh, founded sorry, in, uh, um, in Belgium and then moved to Barcelona. Uh, what Starlab is a private company, a private company that works in all these fields with air force observation data. And that means from satellite, but it means from uh, some distance. So uh, actually, uh, that uh, Uta has shown you is also remote sensing. But in this case, we are experts in the use in the use of satellites. What we do? You, we use satellites to make uh, layers with them and then applications. Two examples. One more academic a project, a European project by ESA. Uh, related with the use of water in all around the world in developing countries. Uh, in this case, the expansion of the urban layer of uh, Yangon in Myanmar. The other one, a project by ourselves, a quality of life indicator called Greendex, because the first layer we uh, put there was related with vegetation, but uh, air quality, traffic, uh, noise, everything can be put inside and get a quality uh, indicator of an area or um, a neighborhood. So, 
what I'm going to explain you were some um, some basic concepts on Earth observation. It's evident that we cannot do a master in 20 minutes, but uh, just uh, a taste. Uh, for all the challenges, uh, what's important to have open data? This is uh, what we are going to explain here. There are a lot of sources of data. There are also uh, non-open data. Maybe you need that data, but uh, this is a very important source of uh, information, the open data. Uh, how to access to that data? Important, very important, because uh, we need that data. So maybe it's already processed, but if I want to process the data, what's the best option? So open software to process, to visualize, and to, mm, well, do everything with that data. Um, nowadays, Cloud computing is everything. So, can we use uh, cloud computing? Yes. And finally, examples. Examples of the services we already have or the things we can do doing all the process. Some concepts. Earth observation. Observing the Earth. Satellites. There are many satellites in, in the space. Some of them are looking uh, outside. Some of them are for communications. But most of them are being used for uh, look at the Earth. Remote sensing, no contact, distance. Um, an instrument, something I get, something I save or keep, and then I process. So I, get a, I, I have a platform, a satellite. I have a target. I am looking at something with a size or in, in a scope, sorry. Uh, an instrument. Maybe a camera, maybe a LiDAR, altimeter, something like that. And information. I keep this information, I store, I send to the Earth, I do something with that. Open data. Nowadays, the most important source of open data by here, Copernicus Sentinel project. Copernicus in general. Sentinel are the satellites. Okay, Copernicus European, paid by, by us, by all us. So. Let's use it. Um, ESA is developing the uh, family of satellites. So its mission of Sentinel, it's a, it's a, a pair of satellites uh, working together and providing data uh, in a um, scheduled and systematic uh, way. In this moment, um uh, there are some of them already getting data uh the other ones are being uh, under construction or projects the first one sentinel one is a sar uh sensor that means radar radar so no problems can work during the day during the night um can even look through the clouds that's very important in some areas of the world. Mm, so it's active. It's the same idea, send a sen uh, signal, and um, here's what is coming back. In this case, Sentinel-1, well, it's a C-band sensor. That's important, but uh, not uh, too much in this moment. High resolution, GSD, the pixel, 10 meters. 10 meters, you say, OK, I, I, I want to look for a car. No, 10 meters, it's not enough. But you have 10 meters all in all the world. A data set of this uh, size is incredible. Revisit time, very important, less than a week. You have images, uh, even two images uh, each week of the same place. Applications, well, a pick of the sensor. This, these sensors are special. The process of this data is complicated because it's looking uh, to, to an, in this case, to the right. Um, you can take images like that and then make applications, or you can use several images to make interferometry, like here. So then you can uh, study the, 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 um, the changes in the height of the terrain because uh, natural changes or after our earthquake, earth earthquake, for example. Sentinel loss, Sentinel-2, in this case, 
the same very similar but in this case optical like photos but with a lot of more colors uh, up to uh, 13 different colors in this case passive it's looking at the light of the sun so during the day during the day sorry uh, it works uh, multispectral the same resolution up to 10, met 10 meters revisit time the same one week the most important this satellite the other one and the next one they are working uh, in a continuous way you know they are going to pass and you are going to get images what can you do almost everything agriculture water um, forestry everything related uh, with um, mm, land resources mm, well it's it's almost uh, infinite sentinel 3 similar to sentinel 2 but in this case um, the pixel size is different it's larger so you can get every day an image but of course with less detail in that case uh, has also other different sensors like uh, an altimeter you can do uh, processes with uh, with that but the main idea is that uh, you get images every day but uh, with a pixel a big uh, well you don't have so much detail uh, most important uh, thermal if you want temperature you need to use this this satellite the idea you can get an image of all the world every day so if you can process it you can uh, have a global idea of what's going on this satellite sentinel 5p it's a uh, it's a uh, it's working it's in the space but it's uh, the development of the sentinel 4 and sentinel 5 it's for atmosphere to, uh, in this case you don't get images you get directly the products so it's working it's producing information again uh, every day you get information of all the world but in this case the size of the pixel it's seven kilometers the idea mm, pollution mm, you can follow the roots of the of the vessels in the sea you can get a lot of information it's not suitable for uh, studies of uh, a city for example a small city because in, in three pixels you get all the city but for a global view of all the world okay in this case in this line we will have sentinel 4 and 5 the 6 is oriented to the eyes of the of the north and south pole and there are many satellites in a study now um, complementary to the this uh, we have seen if uh, we finally get all these satellites we will have an open um, data set uh, that you can use for everything how we access to data several sources or two uh, points for access to data one by ESA by one UMEDSAT UMEDSAT mainly related with weather contamination and things like that the other one the ESA the main one this one Copernicus Open Access Hub it's similar to other um, services you have the links to everything here in the presentation Open Access, access Hub you can choose the area you can choose the satellite all the sentinels from just from one point you need a user a free user you can choose the date you can choose the area it's by near here and then you can download the image the problem is that with so high detail images the products are a big the weight <laughs> of the products are important uh, one sentinel uh, two image sorry uh, it's uh, one terabyte 
So you need some good internet connection and some space and a computer that can play with this. Just one image. So software. Two main softwares, Snap. Snap is by ESA. It's a project by ESA. It's a, an open software. You can do almost every process in Snap. You can also pros, uh, program uh, the graphs. It's like a chain that you can process all the images in the same way. Cross-platform, it's in Java. Uh, you can pre-process. There are also algorithms to obtain information from the images, from vegetation, water, everything. Um, you can look at uh, images with several bands. Mm -hmm. And you can connect from your code in, in Java or in Python directly to the algorithms. That's important. Also, you can develop uh, plugins to work inside or use the already done plugins. The other one, a general software, QGIS. QGIS, now it's a master. You can do everything in QGIS. And you can also use plugins. Everybody's doing plugins to work with QGIS and connecting QGIS with everything. So if you can use uh, QGIS, you are near almost every process uh, in GIS and in remote sensing. It's a, it's a very powerful platform and also you can connect because it's written in, in Python and you can use uh, in an automatic way um, and do almost everything. So, one terabyte, one image, process. What's the problem? Large amount of data. Now I'm going to use rather also um, optical, also thermal. The data is going up. So, um, of course, I, I want to, you, to, to see how is the process of this area. A lot of images, a lot of data. Many, well, Mm, impossible to get all this information. Uh, I, I'm classification, machine learning, the best option. Okay, perfect. GPU. Mm, I want to do this uh, map of all Namibia, all Spain, all Germany. I don't have enough computers, so I need to um, get other different service. And also, can I download everything? At the end, you, 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 you cannot. So, Copernicus also has this project, the so-called DIAS, Data and Information Access Services, that are two things. A repository with all the Sentinel data. The Sentinel data is free, it's open. So, uh, you can access without uh, any cost to this, uh, to this information. You can also download but you can process on the cloud because the, all the data is there. And also, cloud computing services. The basic ones are free, and if you are putting your machine or your code there and doing um, a lot of process, so it's a paid service. Here you have the uh, five main DIAs inside um, Copernicus. They are supported by by Copernicus. Each one is oriented to a different user. The best idea is to visit them and see uh, what's the orientation of them. All of them have all Copernicus data, all Sentinel data. For example, this one, Creo Díaz, it's a, it's nice, it's a sample, because they keep the format of all the images. This is something important, because uh, if you are using their, the standard uh, processes, you need the original uh, format. So for some processes uh, that I do, it's my preferred option. 
Here, non Copernicus. This is private. Google, everybody knows Google, has also ideas with all the data and, of course, more data. The access to the data is free, but uh, even the use of the system now is free. But you know that Google can change the rules in any moment. Well, by now, it's free. Sentinel Hub, similar name or quite similar name to, to that I said before, but it's not the same. It's related with Amazon. It's also a service, uh, the access to the data in all of them, it's free, it's open data, but the computing uh, service is not. Okay, if I follow all the, all the lines, what can I do? Almost everything. It's already done, maybe. So let's first have a look to all the services for Cop of Copernicus that we can um, get by free, already computed, or to get ideas and do the process to get there. Applications of atmosphere. A lot of them. We cannot go inside all of them because mm, we need a year. Um, these all are services that you can connect or download or get information in standard formats. The best idea is to go to the link and uh, check the service. With the sea, everything related with the sea. Chlorophyll, mm, temperature. Okay. Land, land use, land cover, vegetation, applications, everything. Climate. Risk management. Change. Security. Important. You can get cartography, you can get images mm, mm, a day before something has happened. An emergency. What's this? This is an interesting service. Um, because when there's an emergency or something happens in a part of, in some, um, some place of the world, they activate this service. So they have a uh, high priority and these images or these data is processes uh, before all the rest. So you get the results um, uh, very soon. And then these results go to the governments or the uh, decision makers to assist them and how to manage, how to deal with the problem. So at the end, some ideas of uh, Earth observation, um, data we have, we can access, how to access, how to process, how to process now with the state of the art, algorithms with series of data, and examples. You can go inside, you can have an idea and link with the things you are uh, thinking of doing. Mm, what's the link? Because we can link uh, citizen science, getting information and data sets on the ground with the information we get, we get from the satellite. In this case, if you go to the website of uh, CISOL, you will find uh, information on resources on Earth observation, on EO, how to process, etc. Wow! What a roller coaster ride that was. I was doing my best. Yeah, I. Exactly. All that in half an hour. We started with 
so much information about citizen science and the, the thing that stuck in my head, I'm sorry to say this, was data slaves. That was a do not, just in case you've forgotten. And then we start talking about all this great, uh, 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 I, I want to say space, but Earth observation sounds much better. Uh, and I'm thinking, wow, NASA gets all the kudos for the branding and being hip, but wow, don't we do some great stuff here in Europe? And it's all free, and I can just go play with it, and I can download it, except it's a terabyte of picture. <laughs> My hard drive's not going to cope with that, and certainly not my internet connection. Oh, but it's okay, because you've put it all in cloud for me, so I can use it. Except I'm not a nerd. Yeah. Where do I start? And then your last slide is literally, if you don't know where to start, here's an SDK. It's like you've thought the whole thing through for these folks. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are no questions, because it was so <laughs> clear. But let's talk to the audience and see, does anybody have a question of trying to relate this to one of the challenges or uh, something that you're interested in? Mm. Don't all ask at once. Yes, I'm going to bring you the microphone so that we've got it on camera. It's okay, you don't have to stand. Thanks a lot. Uh, one, I can hold myself. Uh, yeah, then you'll never give it. All right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, do you also use like imagery from other open sources? Like, there must be other projects, right, that provide open source material. Is there plans to bring it all together in one platform? Well, uh, in general, um, you can use also NASA uh, data. It's also open. And um, some old missions, for example, by, by French people, are also free in this moment, uh, not the current uh, missions. And there are a lot of different sources of open uh, data. But in this case, that was an example. And that, and to transfer you the idea that you can do almost everything with the European data. But there are, there are sources. Um, for example, some DIAS, DIAS uh, they put together Im uh, information from different sources. So, but it's one uh, choose. Mm, what uh, they want to offer you, but or some even uh, non-free data. So you can use the free data, and if you need, you can ask them and pay for the non-free data. Perhaps right. if I may follow up, uh, uh, perhaps you're aware of GEO, the, the group on Earth observation, and the GEO's group on Earth observation system of systems where all these national space agencies actually collaborate on a global level. Um, and um, also, certainly, uh, projects funded under the European Union, on the Horizon 2020 frameworks, etc., increasingly, of course, also obliged to make their data available. Same goes for citizen science data. Of course, it needs to be very clear during the data collection under which terms and conditions the data is being collected. And also, the actual technical difficulties of harmonizing the data, ensuring uh, data quality, standardizing data from such different sources, making them uh, accessible. There are entire projects simply focused on that aspect alone to make sure that's what we call the in situ component that citizen science can really strengthen within GEOS. I think that was a good answer to your question, right? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else with a question? Something how to relate this to their project or the uh, challenge that they want to be working on for the hackathon or your existing business? Yeah, down on the front row, always the opposite end from where I'm sitting, of course. But it's no problem, I'm here to service you. Yeah, so um, I was quite interested in the uh, citizen science because mm -hmm. uh, it's quite new to me. How do you control that? For example, the data that uh, citizens gather is reliable or uh, they, they do it in a reliable, uh, consistent way or, you know. Mm -hmm. That's where the role of the scientists come in to guide the, the process, not only of the analysis, but certainly of the, the data collection. One of the examples for exa uh, is um, for, uh, the Freshwater Watch that um, an organization called Earthwatch has rolled out, where globally people f can feed in data, but not just anybody. There are kids, there's a training that goes hand in hand with that, including safety training. If you have citizens then going down the banks of, of the riverbed, etc., you don't want injuries either, but you want to ensure consistency of the data collection. 
Having said that, what's so interesting about citizen science is not every single data collection point, every single observation, but also the trends and the diversity and the spaces in which you can suddenly collect data where you haven't gotten to before. Now, now Lucas says we can do anything, everything already with Earth observation. It's not quite true. There are still parts that we can't actually observe, biodiversity being one species that you can't do um, with, with satellites. Um, oh, I see Lucas objecting already. <laughs> Birds being, you know, the, the citizen science example per se, even ranging back a couple of hundreds of years to show that citizen science is actually not that new. What's new is the digital innovations now accelerating citizen science at levels unseen before. But you can get from satellite information of almost everything, but you need ground truth. Yeah. And ground truth comes from here. What a, what a humble answer. <laughs> yeah, coming towards you. Uh, so if I if I recap to the question, uh, how do you ensure the reliability of the data citizens? It's all in the preparation from the scientist perspective. Yeah. You, you've got to get it more right up front because you're letting it go to get yeah, yeah great. Hi. I've got, I want to challenge you. Sorry, thank you for your presentation. And actually, because you mentioned you can take p pictures of everything. How about plastic? That's, I had mentioned it before, my question. Does any of these satellites are helping? Could help us to detect uh, plastic from plastic? Yeah, with the from up there. signature uh, with radar, with SAR. So I'm um, just to, just for yes, some more context for the room, You're thinking plastic in the ocean, for example. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yes, with radar because the water behaves very different of everything. So water plus plastic uh, has different um, signature. So the amount of uh, signal that come back, come back, comes, uh, come back uh, from from this area. There are projects ongoing on on that. But indeed, I think the project ongoing. We need to clarify that right now it's not that easy with Earth observation to Nothing do that. Nothing easy. In fact, again, it's an area where citizen science, you know, is is delivering lots of the data sets currently used on actually how much plastic washes up on beaches, how much plastic is in the rivers, etc. Those data sets, citizens, sorry, scientists are actually drawing on as a primary source for science about the, the extent of plastic pollution in the seas. So this is one of those moments where I get to say the problem with rocket science is it is actually rocket science. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not there yet, but getting there. <laughs> Any more questions from the room? Yep, one behind me. Um, if you were to download, let's say, um, historical data um, and uh, write algorithms that would prove, let's say, the surface water um, of a country has decreased by 15% over the past five years, me as an average Joe uh, with no credentials, um, I can theoretically, as you've proven, um, prove that that has happened. How do I... Um, make my uh, research credible and that people are actually going to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, what's the process behind that? What a great question. Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm right on time. I am going to let you answer the question because yes. I'm fascinated for the answer. Yeah, with the use of the DS, for example, you can um, make your algorithm, the results of your algorithm, uh, public. So everybody can go to to the to this to this uh, project and recompute uh, uh, and get the same conclusions as you. If I may add, like everything in science, supposedly to make it replicable, to check and verify the steps that you have taken. So documentation of the steps you've taken, the data sets you've used, the analysis you've run. You know that's that's what science is all about: making it replicable, making it verifiable by others. And I assume that also means uh, documentation of decisions taken and decisions not taken, why we didn't do that. So when somebody comes back and says, yes, but you should have just done da 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 da, you can say, yeah, but we chose not to do that because da da da, and collective yeah. set. So, good answer to your question. Yep, he's giving us a thumbs up. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that was one of the most fascinating sessions I was in today. Give him another round of applause for uh, braving it to the end of the afternoon.